General Samuel C. Phillips, former commander of the Air Force Systems Command, has had one of the most interesting and varied careers of uh, any of the Air Force pioneers. Beginning in World War II and ending in the maturing days of military space in the mid-1970s, the general's career has involved him in some of the nation's most important undertakings. As a former fighter pilot, General Phillips helped return Europe to normalcy in the early days of post-war occupation times. He helped develop the B-52 as an armament lab member. He helped negotiate an early international arms agreement in the late 1950s. He fathered the Minuteman and Apollo programs. He commanded the Space and Missile Systems Organization and the Air Forces Systems Command. His honors include the General Thomas White Space Trophy, France's Croix de Guerre, and Korea's Order of National Security Merit. What you're about to see is an interview with one of the Air Force's most important pioneers, General Samuel C. Phillips. I'm pleased to be here today with General Sam C. Phillips at Space Division to talk about his interesting career in the United States Air Force. General, welcome to our studios today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. We'd like to take a chronologic view of your career and your life, really, and take it from the beginning and through your Air Force years to the uh, retirement uh, time. Could you tell us, what was it like uh, life for you at the beginning? Uh, you were born in Wyoming. <laughs> what was your family life like? Well, I was actually born in Arizona. Uh, my father was an electrician in a sawmill in uh, Springerville, Arizona, which is in the mountains. And uh, uh, so officially I was born in Arizona, but uh, uh, my family moved away from there when I was only a few months old, so I really can't claim uh, uh, much except the uh, record of birth in Arizona. Uh, my father, as I said, was an electrician. Uh, and uh, he followed uh, the available work uh, up into Colorado, uh, stopping to work for a while in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, then on up to Denver. Uh, I remember uh, Denver because I was in the first grade in Denver. Uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, my family moved uh, on further north and wound up in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, which is really where I grew up. Uh, I was born uh, in 1921. Uh, was the oldest of uh, a family that eventually became uh, six children. Uh, I uh, went through uh, school uh, in Cheyenne, uh, uh, starting, as I remember, about the third grade and uh, went on through, uh, through high school there in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, as I said, my father was uh, an electrician, and I became interested in uh, things electrical and how electricity works and how machinery works uh, uh, in my very early years, and uh, my father was uh, patient enough to uh, teach me some of the elements of, of uh, the technical things involved and uh, sparked uh, a lifelong interest in uh, electricity and uh, electrical uh, equipment and uh, 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 at a very early age uh, I developed a strong interest in radio and uh, uh, started as young people in that period uh, who were interested in such things did, uh, building crystal sets, you know, winding the coils uh, on oatmeal boxes and things of that kind. Uh, and by the time I uh, was midway through uh, high school, uh, I had uh, taken the examination and uh, acquired an amateur radio license and uh, then was uh, busying myself uh, building uh, for what today would be looked on as rather primitive radio equipment, but it was uh, uh, a very fine uh, learning experience and uh, satisfied a very strong interest on my part in, in uh, learning uh, about radio. And uh, turns out, of course, in retrospect, that I was involved in uh, some of the very early uh, period of uh, the development and the evolution of radio and what eventually became electronics. Mm. 
Growing up in the Western United States in the 1930s, did you, would you classify your childhood as typical for that time and place? I think so. Uh, you have to recognize that uh, Wyoming uh, was uh, one of the uh, far west states. Wyoming was uh, uh, admitted uh, to the Union as a state uh, only in the late uh, 1800s, so it had only been a state for, what, 30 or 40 years. So Wyoming was still, a, a, in some respects, uh, uh, the Wild West and uh, a kind of a frontier environment. Uh, and, of course, one of the main activities there in Cheyenne, Wyoming, in those years was uh, Fort uh, Francis E. Russell, which uh, had dated back to the early 1800s when it was, had been established as a an army post to uh, protect settlers uh, from uh, Indian uh, raids and uh, uh, was then uh, uh, evolved over the years to be uh, as a an important uh, permanent uh, uh, army post so part of the environment there in growing up in Cheyenne was uh, uh, the the great west the wild west the frontier environment, uh, the close proximity of the fort. Cheyenne was also a, a, a crossroads of transportation in the United States in those years. Uh, the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad had gone through uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, and uh, the <clears throat> north-south lines from Montana down through uh, Colorado and into New Mexico went through uh, Cheyenne. And the uh, airlines of that period, which were uh, just really beginning as airlines, uh, used Cheyenne as its uh, uh, major crossroads. Uh, it's interesting how uh, the evolution of uh, society proceeds because uh, over the years, uh, that uh, center of transportation uh, gravitated 100 miles south to Denver, Colorado. Uh, but in the uh, 20s and 30s, and I think even into the 40s, uh, Cheyenne was the uh, hub of United Airlines. They had their central maintenance shops there. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, promised me to remember uh, one of the major uh, uh, influences, I think, on my development, uh, because I'd been so interested in, uh, in radio uh, as I uh, was in junior high school and high school, uh, I became aware that uh, there was a radio station out on the airport. Uh, Cheyenne Airport was right on the edge of town and really only a few blocks from where the high school was located. So uh, uh, one day uh, I walked up there after school and uh, wandered into the, uh, what was then Civil Aeronautics Authority uh, radio station, CAA, and uh, uh, told the operator uh, there that I was interested in, in radio and learning about radio and would like to see what they had. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, what went on for then for some years of these operators there in that uh, Airways radio station uh, kind of taking me under their wing and uh, uh, I learned an awful lot then about uh, uh, radio and navigation aids and uh, weather because the weather station was adjacent uh, and of course inevitably about uh, airplanes and flying uh, being right there on the airport at Cheyenne. Learning has always seemed to be an important part of your life. In fact, it uh, impresses me that you've always been a student of sorts. Maybe not a traditional uh, sense in this, the classroom always, but always learning from people around you. What are your earliest recollections of school? Well, my earliest recollections of school really are, are uh, to answer the question specifically, 
uh, the first grade, which reminds me that uh, I try to spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time these days with uh, my grandchildren. Uh, and my 14-year-old uh, grandson is a very precocious young man. And one day in, uh, in a, a discussion, I uh, told him that I remembered the name of my uh, first grade teacher a, in Denver, Colorado, a Miss Henderson. And he said, you know, Grandpa, I'm going to remember that. And from time to time, I'm going to ask you who your first grade teacher is. And if you ever can't answer it, I'll know you're getting seen on it. So. <laughs> So my earliest recollection was uh, Miss Henderson <clears throat> as a first grade teacher in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, just to pursue the uh, early education uh, briefly, uh, as we, uh, as my family migrated north, uh, winding up in Cheyenne, I also remember that my mother, uh, who had been a school teacher before she uh, was married, uh, uh, taught me and uh, uh, my uh, next younger brother uh, for most of a year as we moved uh, th up through northern Colorado and, and into Wyoming. So uh, I think the second grade and perhaps even part of the third grade, uh, my mother uh, uh, taught, uh, taught us and uh, must have been very well because we fitted in as we <coughs> uh, then enrolled uh, in the, uh, in the public school uh, there in Cheyenne. Tell us a little bit more about school. Specifically, how do you remember yourself as a student? Were you a particularly outstanding student? Were you early recognized as a scholar? No, no, not at all. Uh, in my, I, I think uh, I was, my recollection is that I was uh, an average student uh, in my <coughs> grade school years and uh, uh, through <laughs> through uh, junior high school, uh, I think uh, 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 it's a matter of uh, attitude, motivation, and interest in uh, uh, what you're interested in at the time. I, I I make that judgment partly in having spent quite a bit of time with my grandchildren here in recent years. Uh, I didn't become serious as a, a student in terms of uh, getting good grades and uh, 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 earning the kinds of marks that uh, are important for entry into college and uh, <clears throat> later career until uh, uh, late in high school, as a matter of fact. There were some people who were instrumental in helping you gain a vision for the future apparently in school, wasn't there? Yes, there were, and uh, they had considerable influence on my life. Uh, not obvious at the time, but uh, certainly apparent to me in uh, retrospect. Uh, <clears throat> the first of those that I remember very uh, fondly was a man named uh, Lloyd Crane, who was a manual arts teacher in uh, junior high school, and then later he moved uh, up to the high school. And <clears throat> along about the seventh uh, or eighth grade in junior high school, he, for some reason, took an interest in me and uh, singled me out and invited me to accompany him uh, downtown to the uh, uh, periodic uh, luncheon meetings of the Rotary Club. And uh, uh, that then exposed me to, to uh, uh, well, a sphere of uh, people and uh, interests and uh, activities that certainly uh, was outside the normal scope of uh, my life uh, as the uh, a child of a, of a relatively uh, uh, poor uh, family there in, uh, in Wyoming. Uh, a little later, I think probably uh, when I was a junior in high school, uh, <clears throat> another teacher, uh, uh, a man named Paul Albright, uh, uh, took an interest in, uh, in me. Uh, I think he was interested in my interest in uh, radio and things technical. And uh, uh, he uh, encouraged me, urged me, encouraged uh, to uh, pay more attention to uh, schoolwork and uh, getting good grades. And uh, 
Uh, that uh, had some influence because uh, by the within you know my junior year and on into my senior year, I was uh, beginning to uh, get top marks, and uh, he then uh, <clears throat> took the initiative to obtain for me a scholarship to the University of Wyoming. Had you thought about college before that time? I had thought about it, but uh, college was uh, not uh, a, a part of the way of life in the family that I had grown up in. Although, would... my, although my mother had gone to college and was, was a school teacher, uh, uh, somehow college just wasn't uh, a part of the environment and the, and the life that I was uh, growing up in. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, had it not been for the interest that Paul Albright uh, took in me and, uh, uh, and in my development uh, and uh, his action to, to uh, uh, secure a uh, uh, scholarship to the University of Wyoming, I probably wouldn't have gone to college. And uh, obviously, that would have had a profound influence on my life. Of course. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the other members of your family and their school experience. Did uh, you weren't the oldest in your family? Yes, I was the oldest. Yes, I had uh, uh, three brothers and two sisters. Uh, <coughs> uh, none of the uh, brothers or sisters uh, uh, graduated from college although different ones of them had different opportunities, uh, uh, they just weren't motivated to do so for some reason and didn't. Hmm. So the people that influenced you probably had uh, the greatest influence in you going on to college then. Yes, yeah. there's no question about that. It is in college that uh, the military entered into your life uh, through ROTC, is that correct? Yes, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, the uh, University of Wyoming was what was then called a land-grant college. It was the only university in the state of Wyoming, which was one of the less populous states, and for that matter still is. And uh, at least in, in uh, those years, this being in the 30s, uh, uh, land-grant colleges uh, uh, had ROTC programs, uh, and it was a requirement that uh, uh, s uh, students at the university uh, spend, I think, two years in uh, uh, ROTC, Reserve Officer Training, after which it became optional. Uh, in my uh, first two years uh, of uh, uh, there at the university and in those years uh, uh, in the ROTC program, I became very interested. Uh, I became interested in military history and uh, in uh, the uh, 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 developments that uh, were uh, apparent through that training in, uh, in uh, weapons. Uh, and of course, by, by the time, by the late 30s, you remember I en enrolled in the University of Wyoming in the fall of 1938. And then, of course, in 1939, the war in Europe broke out. And by the time uh, I graduated, of course, uh, World War II had started. I graduated in 1942. So during that period, uh, the uh, 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 World War II uh, development uh, was certainly influencing uh, me and, uh, of course, many others uh, to uh, uh, become interested in uh, in the military. Uh, while at the, uh, uh, the university, uh, I uh, uh, might mention the uh, third person uh, who had considerable influence on my life, a, an Army Colonel, Malcolm Craig was his name. He was the professor of military science and tactics at the uh, university. And uh, in my junior year, uh, he urged me to take a competitive examination for a regular commission in the Army. Uh, you know, through the ROTC program, I would uh, have been awarded a, uh, uh, a reserve commission in the Army, in the infantry. Uh, but he offered me the opportunity to uh, 
uh, take the competitive exam for a regular commission and as a matter of fact urged me to do it. So I did take the examination and uh, was then offered a commission in the regular army. And uh, this would have been uh, uh, probably uh, <clears throat> in the middle of 1941 uh, that uh, that uh, uh, offer was made and I accepted it. Uh, Did that mean you had an idea perhaps for a career in the military? Uh, it was certainly uh, uh, becoming a, uh, a stronger option because by then, in addition to my other interests, I had uh, also developed a strong uh, interest and involvement in flying. And uh, the way that developed was uh, in uh, either in 1940 or 1941, uh, uh, at the national level in the United States, there was uh, obviously uh, uh, increasing awareness of the developing war situation. Did you follow the headlines uh, anyway? Oh, you yes. were aware? Oh, yes. I can remember uh, uh, being uh, riveted to the radio on the uh, occasions of uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats, which uh, were which developed somewhere in that period as he uh, would announce, the president would announce in advance uh, a, a time when uh, uh, he would re report to the nation in what was called a fireside chat. And I can remember gathering in the room of uh, our uh, uh, house mother at the fraternity house where I lived uh, there at the campus to listen to President Roosevelt uh, and so, yes, I was certainly following mm -hmm. the, uh, the news and the headlines. Especially that of aviation, apparently, as your interest developed. Yes. What I started to mention was that uh, a program was established uh, called uh, Civilian Pilot Training. And uh, what was offered then uh, was an opportunity for qualified young people to enroll first in their primary course, which uh, offered uh, uh, ground instruction and flying instruction to qualify for a private license. And uh, so I enrolled in that uh, actually uh, between years in college in the summer of 1941. And during that summer, uh, uh, qualified then for a private license. And I then enrolled in their secondary course as I went back to school in the fall at the University of Wyoming. This would have been in the fall of 1941. And uh, pursued their secondary course. So uh, uh, sort of concurrently with the development that I mentioned of taking a competitive exam uh, for an ROTC regular commission, uh, I was developing a, a very strong interest in flying. And I think almost simultaneously with the completion of the secondary uh, uh, flying course, uh, uh, the uh, uh, attack on Pearl Harbor occurred on December 7th, 1941. And uh, it was by then quite apparent mm. that I and many others were uh, destined uh, for uh, uh, for military duty. So I applied through the proper channels for a transfer of my commission from uh, the infantry where I was being commissioned to the Army Air Corps, uh, which by then I had uh, uh, acquired quite a, bit, quite a bit of flying uh, time. And uh, But this uh, was all civilian time. There was no pilot training for college students for military service. No, no. No, this was all strictly civilian uh, flying time and so you had a an interest in joining the army air corps even though you were uh, headed towards an infantry career yes uh, as i said i had already applied for a transfer to the air corps uh, my uh, orders to active duty uh, came through in the uh, late spring of 1942 uh, concurrently almost with graduating with a bachelor of science degree in electrical engineering uh, my orders were uh, uh, to uh, the infantry school at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, 
for uh, uh, training for, in preparation for uh, assignment then to uh, an infantry uh, division. Uh, that, uh, I remember I reported for duty on the 11th of June, 1942, at Fort Benning. Uh, that course was uh, uh, of the order of uh, eight or ten weeks in length, and a very, very fine course, uh, I still remember. A uh, very excellent preparation for uh, 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 duty as a, a line uh, infantry lieutenant. Uh, but while I was at Fort Benning, uh, I was still very interested in being transferred to the Air Corps. Now, did you keep this to yourself, or what did the people around you think about your interest in the Army Air Corps? Was it fashionable to be in the, uh, the Air Corps? Was it looked down upon? What was the, the sense in those days? Uh, I certainly didn't keep it to myself. I, uh, 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 from time to time, would inquire through the, through the uh, training unit that I was assigned to at Fort Benning uh, about my application. Uh, the attitude uh, uh, was was certainly, if anything, friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember this was uh, only a few months into uh, the United States' involvement in a major way in World War II. Uh, it was a period of uh, <coughs> very rapid uh, mobilization in the in the country. A period of uh, very, very rapid growth of the uh, army, which I was so directly involved in. Of course, parallel uh, rapid expansion of the navy. Uh, so it was uh, quite a uh, a friendly uh, environment. There was not uh, uh, any uh, resistance or hostility mm -hmm. that I mm -hmm. uh, can remember. The war seemed to be uh, as popular a war as this nation has been involved in. Uh, there was never any doubt uh, that, that you would be involved in that war throughout your uh, later high school years and college, or did you see war coming? Was it something that... Uh... Well, uh, I fully anticipated that uh, we in this country would be involved in war uh, certainly at least by uh, 1940, so that during my junior, senior years in uh, college, uh, it's, I had no doubt that we would be involved in, uh, in uh, World War II. Uh, you called it a, a popular war. Uh, I don't, wouldn't quarrel with the term necessarily. Uh, I guess I dislike the thought that wars are popular. Uh, wars are, uh, are a scourge of mankind. Uh, they're terribly destructive uh, of life and uh, uh, property, nations. Uh, for whatever the reason, uh, mankind seems to uh, have based uh, much of its history on the uh, major milestones that are wars and the events of wars. So wars seem to be inevitable in the course of uh, human affairs. Uh, the, uh, I think rather than think of it in my, for myself at least, as a popular war, uh, I would, I tend to think of World War II as uh, an absolutely necessary war to stop the uh, encroachment of a tyrannical uh, society uh, on the world at large, including ultimately if we had not uh, resisted uh, our own country, this being uh, uh, the Germany, uh, Nazi Germany under uh, Adolf Hitler, who uh, uh, to me at least by the uh, early 40s, uh, my latter part of uh, years in college, uh, seemed uh, 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 quite bent on uh, the uh, subjugation of uh, certainly of Europe and uh, uh, the world at large, and it was then a, a necessary struggle to mm. to uh, uh, 
uh, stop the uh, uh, encroachment of uh, that tyrannical society on ourselves, mm. as, to say nothing of the rest of the world. Of course, they're complicating uh, I, uh, the, uh, the Japanese attack on world uh, on uh, Pearl Harbor uh, <clears throat> was a direct attack on the United States and our citizens' interests and uh, uh, required uh, uh, immediate reaction. Mm. And of course that signaled the, the uh, rapid expansion uh, and preparation for uh, a major, uh, major war. Mm. In addition to the struggles that was going on on a major scope uh, with the, the armed conflict, there was a struggle going on in your life at the time in transitioning into uh, the cockpit. Uh, was, it a, was this an easy transition? We left you in infantry training. How did you get into the, the Air Force? The How did Army I get Air in the Air Force? Yes, sir. Well, uh, I, as I finished uh, the uh, infantry school uh, uh, there at Fort Benning, and this would have been, I think, in September, so that course perhaps was... Uh, was of the order of 90 days. I was assigned to uh, the 43rd Infantry Division at uh, Fort Ord, California, as uh, the uh, signal officer in one of the regiments. Uh, I was assigned as a signal officer because of my interest in radio and my college education as an electrical engineer. Um, I was uh, I reported for duty uh, uh, at uh, Fort Ord. Uh, by then, uh, I was married. Uh, uh, to digress momentarily, I was married uh, in the middle of August of 1942 at Fort Benning, Georgia. Excuse me but, for just uh, a moment. <coughs> Didn't they used to have a saying in those days that if you were meant to be married, you would have been issued a wife? <laughs> How did it come about that uh, you you got married in the midst of that? <clears throat> uh, I married... Uh, uh, a girl who had uh, been uh, my sweetheart, my girlfriend, uh, from the age that I was about uh, 14 uh, there in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, she had been a Texas girl who had uh, uh, been raised in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas until she was 13 or so and then moved to Cheyenne to live with her father, who uh, was in Cheyenne. And I met her when the two of us were about 14. Uh, so as I was ordered to active duty in uh, June of uh, 1942, uh, uh, I left her there in Cheyenne. She was by then uh, uh, working for the telephone company. And uh, between us, we uh, uh, agreed that uh, uh, she would come down to Fort Benning in August, and we were married then uh, at Fort Benning in the middle of August. So I went accompanied then by a wife to uh, Fort Ord, California in, uh, in September. Uh, the the uh, uh, 43rd Division at Fort Ord was uh, being mobilized and in its final state of, of preparation to load on troop transports for invasion of Guadalcanal. And uh, uh, so I was there only a very brief time, but, uh, and was confined to the post uh, 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 for the obvious reasons of, of the uh, state of preparation mm -hmm. and uh, readiness for a deployment. Uh, <coughs> One evening, uh, I got a pass to go down into Monterey uh, to visit my, with my wife. And uh, as we walked the streets of Monterey one evening, uh, I stopped in a Western Union office and uh, sent a telegram to Chief of the Army Air Corps of uh, the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, I've forgotten the phrasing of it, but you... In those days, uh, a telegram was, uh, you, were, you were allowed 10 words uh, for a certain rate, and beyond that, it became uh, more expensive. So whatever I said, I said in 10 words. But the message was, if you want me in the Air Corps, uh, you better be sending orders. <laughs> 
<laughs> that would seem pretty brash uh, to a lot of people. Uh, in retrospect, how, to, how do you view, did it have an effect, do you think? Was it something you'd do again? Well, I agree with you. It uh, is something which uh, I've thought about a lot of times uh, in the later years of my career. And it's probably something that I would, uh, would uh, I certainly wouldn't encourage it uh, of uh, people that would, uh, uh, I was responsible for and as a more senior officer. <clears throat> but uh, under the right circumstances and done in the right way, uh, I would have probably been sympathetic if something of that type had occurred to people in my command in later years. Uh, it's certainly out of channels, you know, sending a commercial telegram. Uh, but uh, it, it produced results because uh, I think it was about three days later when uh, uh, <clears throat> I was out in a, in a forested area there on the very large military reservation that is Fort Ord with my uh, regimental uh, communications platoon. Uh, the old hand sergeants that were in that platoon were taking this brand new second lieutenant under their wing and trying to teach me what I needed to know to, uh, uh, to handle my job, which uh, 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 is incidentally one of the very important uh, elements of uh, military relationships is uh, but that's incidental uh, but uh, while we were out on this uh, uh, field exercise a, uh, a courier a runner came out with a message uh, which he delivered to me and it was a message from the chief of the Air Corps, uh, or his spokesperson, uh, uh, announcing uh, that orders were being issued transferring me uh, to uh, the Army Air Corps uh, for uh, training uh, as a pilot. And uh, so it, that message or that telegram uh, certainly must have had its effect. Good. And you did, in fact, enter pilot training. What was the first weapon system and where did you begin your <coughs> flying training with the military? Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the pilot training uh, scheme, uh, this being now uh, uh, the fall of 1942, uh, here on the West Coast at least, involved pre-flight training at uh, an Army post that had been established at Santa Ana, California. Uh, that was more or less uh, uh, a uh, a center where cadets and the few of us who were being brought in as uh, already commissioned officers for training in grade were given some preliminary instruction. And <clears throat> that was only a matter of a very few weeks, two or three perhaps. And I was sent then to uh, primary training at uh, Tulare, California. <coughs> uh, uh, primary <coughs> training was... Uh, Would that be on, like undergraduate uh, pilot training today? Then? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. The <coughs> What today we, we call undergraduate pilot training was divided into uh, four phases. The pre-flight, primary, basic, and advanced, which uh, took uh, uh, a little over, it was of the order of six months. And uh, so primary was two months at Tulare. That was a contract flying school. In other words, the Army Air Corps had contracted with a company hmm. to to uh, uh, set up the uh, necessary uh, facilities and equipment for both ground instruction and uh, and flight training. This must have been repetition, uh, largely for well, you. Well, primary to a considerable extent was repetition of what I had already uh, uh, accomplished in the civilian pilot training. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but uh, that gave me an opportunity, at least, for, uh, I, I'd think of it as a, a deepening of my, my uh, experience in flying. Uh, and it, it permitted me, uh, with the basis of what I'd already done in flying, to, uh, to qualify fairly rapidly for, uh, uh, to meet the requirements of the primary training. But <clears throat> Uh, the uh, <coughs> the uh, airplanes in primary were the Stearman PT-17, 
Uh, and as I mentioned, the uh, flying school was was uh, <coughs> was done uh, by a contractor. There were a few uh, Army Air Corps officers assigned as check pilots and to uh, ensure that the conduct of the of the training uh, was uh, uh, in accordance with the Army's requirements. Uh, so two months of primary, and then I was moved to uh, basic uh, flying school, which was uh, up at uh, Lemoore, California. Um, I think that's a base which uh, post-war uh, was transferred to the Navy. I think it's a Navy base now, but uh, the basic then <clears throat> was uh, an Army-conducted operation. There were Army officers as instructors, and uh, that was two months of of duration. And Is that where you began picking up new skills, would you say? At what point? Oh, in yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in basic, you start to being introduced to the link trainer uh, for instrument flying. And uh, as I recall, we were introduced uh, to um, instrument flying under the hood in the basic trainers. The trainers we flew there at Lemoore were uh, a BT-13 and a BT-15, which were made by a company uh, named Volte, which uh, no, <clears throat> no longer exists. Uh, uh, we were introduced uh, also to uh, formation flying and uh, to uh, many of the maneuvers that uh, are required and traditional in uh, flying uh, fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, after two months there, then <coughs> uh, was assigned to advanced flying school, which was at uh, Williams Field near Phoenix in Arizona. Excuse me, were your, was your family moving with you throughout this time? Yes. Uh, uh, my family uh, consisted of my wife, mm -hmm. and yes, she was traveling with me, and uh, uh, in Tulare, we lived in a in a hotel, uh, which was quite affordable in those days, especially in Tulare. Um, in uh, Lemoore, uh, we had a uh, a room in in a house, and the same at uh, Chandler, Arizona, which is on the outskirts of uh, Williamsfield. Uh, at uh, Williams was equipped in those days as a twin-engine uh, fighter training base. And I considered myself extremely fortunate to, uh, to be assigned uh, uh, in advanced flying school to a base the uh, majority of whose graduates were fighter pilots. And uh, as I say, I was a multi-engine fighter, and the only one of, of those in the early years of World War II, of course, was the P-38, the Lockheed Lightning uh, P-38. So in the course of the uh, two months uh, there at, um, at uh, Williams Field, uh, uh, I uh, completed the then uh, required Army curriculum for instrument flying and uh, uh, formation and gunnery and, and uh, uh, fighter bombing and all the other uh, basic uh, skills that uh, were required of uh, fighter pilots. Uh, and the uh, final phase of uh, basic training uh, there in, uh, in that period was flying time in an airplane that was called the P-322. And it was a P-38 in all respects except that it had no superchargers. It had been uh, built uh, by Lockheed, I'm told, or was told then, uh, to uh, uh, be shipped under Lend-Lease to the British. And uh, the British wanted it for a low-level operation. And uh, therefore, they didn't anticipate the requirement for the turbine-driven superchargers that were uh, a standard feature of the uh, Army Air Corps P-38. Uh, so uh, I then got several hours of, uh, of uh, flying in, in that uh, version of the uh, P-38. Was it an easy system to learn, do you think, in comparison? Uh, yes, the, uh, I found it easy to learn. The, uh, 
uh, <coughs> the uh, the P-38 was uh, really a quite an advanced uh, uh, machine. Uh, it was, as I th have thought back on it many times over the years, uh, uh, a very good job was done in the man-machine uh, interface and interrelations. The arrangement of controls and instruments uh, uh, seemed very natural. Uh, it was a pretty complicated airplane, uh, not only with twin engines, but it had electric propellers and uh, uh, it had uh, what was called a Fowler flap, which uh, uh, would initially extend uh, horizontally just to extend the wing surface and then droop down. And so it had a two position setting, uh, which was very important for uh, maneuverability. Uh, and those of us who had the opportunity to really learn how to fly the P-38 uh, could, I, I say, make that airplane do anything. Uh, on one occasion uh, later during World War II, uh, my squadron commander engaged uh, in a duel with uh, a squadron commander of a Spitfire squadron on the occasion on a Sunday uh, there at our base in England uh, where the RAF squadron and our squadron got together for a Sunday picnic. And uh, so those two commanders got up and met head on with a P-38 and a Spitfire. And it was only a matter of a very few minutes until uh, uh, the P-38 was on the Spitfire's tail and the Spitfire was one of the most maneuverable airplanes that uh, was ever built. Mm. So that P-38 flown by a pilot who, who uh, had had the opportunity to learn how to fly it, uh, literally could do anything. Mm. It was a magnificent airplane. What happened to you then as you completed flying training? Uh, well, I uh, was assigned uh, rather immediately uh, to a P-38 uh, uh, group. Uh, I was transferred initially from Williams Field to uh, uh, Muroc Army Air Base, which today is Edwards Air Force Base. In those years, uh, Muroc was, uh, was a strip on the dry lake. It had tar paper shacks uh, as opposed to buildings. Uh, it was uh, mainly a, uh, uh, a P-38 uh, uh, operational training unit. It was where Pilots uh, uh, graduating from uh, flying school were assigned for introduction to the P-38. And, and I was only there, I think, about three weeks for uh, a rapid uh, uh, fire set of training in the P-38. Uh, and then was assigned to a newly forming uh, fighter group. It was the 364th Fighter Group, which was being mobilized and organized at uh, uh, Van Nuys. Uh, what is today Van Nuys Airport. It was then called Van Nuys Army Air Base. Uh, <clears throat> and the 364th group, which uh, consisted of three squadrons, 383rd, 84th, and 85th, uh, was, was basically organized and uh, 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 most of the pilots were assigned uh, during the very brief period that we were there at Van Nuys. And then my squadron uh, was transferred to uh, Ontario, what is today Ontario International Airport, was then called Ontario Army Air Base. And uh, uh, we had probably three or between three and four months of concentrated uh, training there at Ontario as a squadron. And it was in that period that uh, I and the other pilots that were assigned uh, initially to that uh, uh, squadron really learned how to fly that P-38. It was a magnificent airplane. A lot of pre preparations to go through at that time. There were preparations on the coast going along at the time, too. True. This was, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is now the summer of 43. And uh, in that period, uh, the, there was considerable concern to provide for coastal defenses, particularly on the west coast, uh, anticipating uh, uh, 
uh, military action of uh, limited or more extensive nature uh, by the Japanese. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> our primary job was to train ourselves or to be trained for deployment uh, ultimately to Europe, it turned out. Uh, but our secondary mission was, uh, uh, was coastal defense and uh, to interoperate with uh, the uh, coast artillery and uh, army units that were responsible for uh, coastal defenses on the west coast. Talking about the coastal defenses, let me ask you about the, the sense of the American populace at that time. The civilian uh, people were concerned about, uh, here in California anyway, the possibility of uh, attack from, uh, from the, uh, the sea. Yes, there was concern. <clears throat> there, there definitely was. Uh, I don't recall that the mood uh, was uh, in any way fearful. It was more guarded than uh, than apprehensive or or truly fearful. Uh, I might have missed <clears throat> some of the uh, uh, environment of the times being pretty much confined to our our mission of training, uh, but in general, uh, I didn't see it as as uh, truly scared. It was more guarded. Mm. Well, let me ask you, as a father, did you see it any differently than as a, a single uh, man or as a married man? You became a father during this uh, time, did you not? Yes, our first child was born in uh, July of 1943, which was uh, uh, coincident with the formation of the <coughs> 364th Fighter Group, of which I was a part. Um, I... I uh, don't really recall that my uh, dedication to the defense of the United States was uh, really any different as a husband, as a father, than it had been as an individual. Uh, I suppose in subtle ways it might have, but uh, it was not apparent. To me, uh, it's kind of interesting as I think back to that time that uh, <coughs> uh, the, the uh, response of the populace in general, certainly the part of the populace that I uh, knew best and was a part of, to the uh, 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 war situation, first in Europe and then the attack by the Japanese, was uh, spontaneous and automatic. And uh, the uh, <clears throat> need to defend the United States was uh, just obvious and apparent. and. Uh, the uh, willingness to mobilize and become dedicated to uh, defending this country uh, uh, was really not an issue. Uh, uh, certainly was not to uh, people of uh, my generation, uh, those that I was very much uh, directly involved with. There was a consensus. <clears throat> there was a very strong consensus. About this time, you uh, went with the 364th to an overseas location. How did you make that move? And uh... Well, uh, our fighter group, uh, which had trained as three squadrons at the separate locations, uh, my squadron being in Ontario, was then reassembled uh, late in 1943 at uh, Santa Maria, California. And... Uh, we were not informed of what was going on, except that our squadron was ordered to Santa Maria and the others and the group headquarters were all reassembled there. Uh, and we were there only for a very brief time when uh, we were uh, loaded on a train, uh, which uh, found its way across the United States to New York. And uh, after a brief uh, stay in the uh, facilities of the port at New York. We were loaded on the Queen Elizabeth uh, and uh, transported rather expeditiously uh, to uh, Liverpool, England, where we disembarked and uh, again uh, on trains were transported to 
a base in uh, East Anglia, uh, near Bury St. Edmunds, called Huntington. It had been one of the uh, old uh, line Royal Air Force bases, which the RAF had turned over to the uh, United States, the Army Air Corps. And uh, we shared that base with uh, a B-17 uh, uh, depot, which uh, the Army Air Corps had established uh, with major shops for um, uh, repairing major, major battle damage and overhauling of uh, B-17s. Uh, that was one of the activities on the base, but the main activity uh, was our fighter group. How did the citizens of that area feel about having you there? Oh, they welcomed us uh, with open arms. Uh, uh, this was uh, at the end of 43, the early part of 1944, uh, by which time uh, the uh, uh, Battle of Britain uh, had uh, already been won. The uh, Royal Air Force had, uh, had uh, stopped the uh, uh, German uh, 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 thrust to invade Great Britain and had uh, largely stopped the uh, aerial attacks on uh, British cities. Uh, but uh, of course, the uh, uh, by late '43, early '44, all of continental Europe was occupied by uh, Nazi Germany, and the only stronghold of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe uh, that remained was the British uh, Isles. And uh, So the outcome of the war at this time was very much in question, wasn't it? Yes, it certainly was, very much in question. Uh, had, in that period, the, uh, 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 the German armies were uh, still well, they were very much involved with, um, with uh, a thrust to the east into Russia. Uh, and they were, of course, uh, defending uh, the part, all of Western Europe, which they had captured, and were uh, uh, at least uh, uh, as we were briefed at the time, uh, we're preparing for uh, further assaults on uh, uh, the British Isles, which were the remaining holdout. Uh, <clears throat> so our group's uh, uh, entry into England was one of a very massive buildup by the U.S. Army of uh, ground troops as well as flying units. Uh, our group uh, with P-38s was uh, one of the uh, first groups of fighters that had uh, truly long-range uh, capability. Uh, the fighters that were in England in the uh, Army Air Corps' 8th Air Force prior to that time were uh, started out largely as uh, P-47s. And the P-47 uh, was the Republic uh, single engine, uh, uh, radial engine airplane, but it was quite short range. And uh, they could uh, accompany bombers uh, across the English Channel and uh, in to, to a limited distance inside uh, Belgium or France. Uh, but that was the limit of their range. And uh, they were a very effective fighter, and they, uh, the P-47 groups, uh, uh, were credited with uh, destroying a significant number of Luftwaffe fighters as they attacked our bombers. Uh, the uh, uh, P-51 was being introduced uh, uh, in a very limited way in that same period, late 43, early 44. But the first of the P-51s were relatively short range. Uh, they could go somewhat further than the P-47s, uh, perhaps deep into Belgium, France, uh, Holland. Uh, but their range uh, was limited. So the P-38 was the first uh, truly long-range fighter. Bombers were glad to see you come. And they were very glad to uh, see us. And uh, uh, after uh, uh, one very limited mission just to introduce us to uh, 
uh, the fact that uh, we were going to get shot at and that we were in fact in war, uh, that limited mission being largely down the coast of France to uh, uh, escort bombers on a, uh, on a raid uh, in the Bordeaux area, which as I say was a pretty limited mission. Uh, that was our introduction. But our first uh, then uh, a major mission uh, were the, was the uh, first uh, uh, raid of U.S. Uh, bombers in daylight on Berlin. So our group was assigned as a target cover, which meant that we uh, had to be over Berlin at uh, oh, 37 or 38,000 feet uh, in advance of the bombers' arrival. Uh, and so that kind of defined the, the uh, purpose and mission and, uh, and range of the, of the P-38 uh, uh, early in 44. What kind of a role do you think the, the P-38 had then in turning the, uh, the conquest? Uh... Uh, I'd say that it had a very substantial role. Uh, uh, the, the P-38... Uh, I've forgotten now just how many groups of us there were in England. Uh, there were perhaps four P-38 groups, uh, uh, of which ours was one. Uh, uh, and uh, because of the uh, long range and, and high maneuverability and very high altitude capability, uh, our group uh, which I will mention later, converted uh, mid-war to P-51s. Uh, during the course of the entire war, was credited with destroying something more than 400 uh, Luftwaffe airplanes. So you were meaning very heavy <coughs> defenses uh, yes. by the Luftwaffe, apparently. Yeah, the, the, uh, um, the Eighth Air Force was the uh, strategic air force. It's mission was uh, long-range bombing raids on uh, key industrial and military installations uh, in Germany and in the peripheral uh, uh, areas. Uh, the purpose of the fighters was to escort the bombers and to protect them uh, from uh, attack by uh, German fighters. Uh, the uh, so, uh, in a, in a, I guess in a both a direct and, uh, and an indirect way, uh, the mission of the 8th Air Force uh, was to destroy, uh, the, to gain air superiority and to uh, uh, destroy the uh, uh, ability of the Luftwaffe to uh, interdict our bombers and to uh, inflict damage on, uh, on them. In a period of of only a few months, uh, uh, that mission was accomplished, and uh, the uh, German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was uh, rendered relatively ineffective. Uh, and it was a, a to a, to a high degree, it was the result of uh, action by Eighth Air Force fighters in the course of their operations in escorting bombers and uh, attacking and uh, destroying fighters in the process. Now, was that the exclusive role of the, the P-38, or was it also used for ground tactics, bombing, or other missions? Uh, it was used uh, for ground attack as well. Uh, I'm, I should point out that as the, the ability of the Luftwaffe to put up uh, substantial uh, airplane forces opposing our bombers uh, declined because they, of our uh, uh, efforts. Uh, <clears throat> our uh, mission uh, initially was would include escorting for a particular phase of the, of the bombers track and mission after which we were then instructed to uh, attack uh, certain airfields there in Germany. Uh, meaning ground attack uh, with uh, our guns and uh, then later still uh, we were assigned uh, missions uh, purely uh, 
uh, ground attack and in the early phase of this activity uh, we would be assigned a particular area uh, in which there was uh, one or more uh, uh, Luftwaffe airfields and our mission was to uh, destroy airplanes and the ability of those airfields to uh, operate. So uh, the P-38 uh, uh, with its long-range escort capability uh, was a very effective uh, uh, aerial fighter uh, and uh, it also uh, uh, had very effective firepower for a fighter. It had not only uh, four fifty caliber machine guns in the nose but a twenty millimeter cannon which was quite effective. Uh, and it also had the ability to carry either uh, fuel tanks for extended range on the pylons under the wings or bombs uh, uh, up to a thousand pounds. So uh, on some of our missions when it became, when our group was assigned to ground attack, uh, this being deep in Germany for uh, 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 either attacks on airfields or uh, other military targets, uh, we would uh, be loaded with one bomb and a fuel tank, or on even on some occasions, I remember, we would uh, uh, carry two bombs. Mm. Now, as the war progressed uh, and the Luftwaffe began having difficulties, the, the Germans tried to introduce and use technology to turn the course of the battle back in their favor. Uh, some of these technologies you were there to witness. Tell us about some of them. Uh, the first one that, uh, that uh, was quite apparent was the uh, V-1 uh, buzz bomb, so-called. That was the uh, small, unmanned drone uh, which was uh, launched from uh, very long uh, ramps that had been built along uh, the uh, coast of France and Belgium. Uh, these uh, uh, ramps uh, were used to launch with a rocket assist uh, this uh, small drone uh, which had a pulse jet engine. It had a very characteristic sound. You could hear it pulsing away as it flew. Uh, uh, and those uh, uh, V1s, or buzz bombs, as they were called, uh, were quite inaccurate. But then you have to remember that London was a very large city. And uh, their prime target uh, was uh, London. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, V1s were, uh, oh, I think in a, in a, in a in a major way, uh, they were relatively ineffective, but but they were effective in uh, affecting the morale of the populace and in doing uh, worrisome destruction. Uh, uh, one of the routes of those buzz bombs, I guess it must they must have been launched from Holland, uh, was more or less near our base, so it was not uncommon at night for us to be. Uh, uh, to have the air raid siren go off and uh, go to the air raid shelter. You could hear one of those buzz bombs pulsing away overhead. And uh, the thing you always wanted to listen for with those buzz bombs was uh, uh, the engine stopping because that was that meant it was going to dive on its target. Uh, the Royal Air Force uh, uh, perfected uh, uh, a number of techniques to defend against those. If you remember in the major mission sense the uh, uh, the British uh, had the responsibility for home defense, which included air defense, so the Royal Air Force had the air defense mission. Uh, the U.S. Air Force, uh, U.S. Air Army Air Corps, uh, was always there if called upon, but the prime mission was RAF for defense. And one of the techniques that the RAF developed, uh, which was effective in daylight, was to uh, uh, get into formation with a buzz bomb as it flew across the uh, North Sea or the English Channel, and to get a wing under the uh, wing of the of the of the drone and flip it, and that would tumble its gyro and it would spin in in the ocean. Hmm. Uh, of course, the British also had uh, anti-aircraft -air artillery uh, and 
So the buzz bomb was the first and, and apparent. Another of the uh, innovations that I saw was a vertically launched uh, rocket uh, airplane, which, as I recall, was called the ME-263. Uh, I believe it was the ME-263. But it was uh, launched uh, uh, vertically uh, uh, and at a, at a time when, <clears throat> when the bomber formation, which we always call the bomber stream, uh, was uh, flying overhead so that it would fly up through the formation and the pilot in this uh, vertically uh, launched uh, machine could fire at bombers as he went up and then as its rocket fuel expended he'd push over and he could fire again on his way down before he landed. Uh, I saw on uh, at least one occasion uh, one of these ME-263 uh, uh, attacks and uh, so that was uh, 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 a pretty far-reaching, uh, innovative uh, approach in, in that time. Now, that was different from the jet aircraft that they Oh, yes, used. yes. The uh, jet appeared a little later than, appeared operationally a little bit later than this rocket uh, that I described. Uh, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> German introduction of the ME-262, which was a uh, turbojet-propelled uh, uh, airplane, armed with 30 millimeter cannon, uh, was a very fast and very effective airplane. Uh, that appeared, uh, oh, early 45. It was quite late in the war, by which time uh, uh, most of the uh, German airfields had been uh, destroyed, in uh, not only in Germany, but in the occupied mm -hmm. countries. And the uh, Germans introduced the ME-262, flying them from sections of the Autobahn down in Bavaria, which they had uh, fenced off, uh, the Autobahn being the uh, major uh, uh, highways. Uh, and uh, they built uh, dispersal areas and parking areas and service areas off in the forest at the side of the Autobahn. So they'd pull the ME-262 up on the section of the Autobahn uh, Autobahn and take it off, and uh, uh, they uh, uh, had uh, somewhat limited range of uh, jet airplanes, turbojets operating at low altitude, uh, uh, burn a lot of fuel, but it was fast, and uh, it <coughs> was it had uh, uh, some effectiveness then in attacking uh, uh, the. Uh, U.S. Army Air Corps uh, uh, airplanes that were operating. By then, of course, the, uh, uh, the Ninth Air Force was accompanying the uh, uh, ground armies as they were advancing across uh, the occupied countries and into Germany. So <clears throat> the main attacks of the uh, ME-262 uh, were uh, on the uh, uh, medium bombers of the Ninth Air Force and the uh, uh, fighter bombers of the Ninth mm -hmm. Air Force. Uh, I was on at least a couple of uh, missions when ME-262s appeared and uh, as I say they were uh, they were very fast and uh, quite effective airplanes. If they had been in introduced operationally uh, many months earlier it could uh, definitely have influenced the uh, course of the war. Uh, I might point out that uh, the reaction of the uh, Army Air Corps was pretty rapid to the appearance of the 262. And uh, that was in the form of providing to us, which uh, we were then equipped uh, by then with uh, P-51s, with a uh, fuel additive. Uh, the additive was a compound uh, involving boron, which when added to the uh, aviation fuel that we were using in the P-51, enabled us to uh, increase the uh, power, uh, the horsepower of the engine very substantially. I remember the, uh, the military power setting on the P-51 with uh, our normal uh, aviation gasoline was uh, 3,000 RPM and uh, uh, 60 inches of manifold pressure. Mm 
And with this boron additive, we could increase the manifold pressure up to 85 inches. So that was a very substantial increase in horsepower. The price we paid, though, for using that uh, fuel additive and the high power that it permitted uh, was a very short life for the engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, that 85 inches of manifold pressure was, was used for uh, a few minutes during a mission to chase a 262 or to engage uh, a 262, uh, it meant changing the engine uh, when we got back. But my recollection, which may be uh, slightly exaggerated, uh, was that with that fuel additive, the P-51 uh, uh, was almost a match for the, P, uh, for the ME-262. So that... Uh, you could get out of a tight spot or... Certainly. Mm. And, uh, but more importantly, could uh, pursue mm. an ME-262. Because you remember that uh, their range was somewhat limited, so if one was spotted in an attack, uh, then uh, a P-51 could immediately proceed in the direction of engaging it. And uh, uh, some of the ME-262 kills were uh, by pursuing it uh, after it had made its attack uh, mm -hmm. and being able with the, uh, uh, the fuel additive to, uh, to catch it and... Uh, uh, or to pursue it long enough to, uh, to uh, uh, destroy it. Hmm. A lot of the technological advances that Germans were making at the time weren't readily visible. Uh, they were highly classified. They weren't introduced operationally, as you mentioned, until late in the war. What kind of impact uh, to the young pilot uh, at the time uh, did the new technologies have? Were you uh, affected any more than your peers? Uh, uh, well, I may have been because I remember uh, uh, interesting myself to uh, very much in the daily intelligence reports after the V1 appeared on the scene. So uh, uh, I can re remember spending time with our intelligence uh, unit there in our ready facilities uh, inquiring into what additional information they had been given uh, the V-1 was the first, and this uh, rocket airplane, the ME-263 that I mentioned. Uh, in the same period, uh, but a little later, uh, the uh, German V-2, the uh, uh, short-range uh, uh, ballistic rocket appeared on the scene. Uh, their main target, again, was London. Uh, the V-2 was... Uh, uh, had a range of uh, 100 or 100 plus miles, so they had to have built their launching bases uh, pretty much in the occupied countries. Uh, it was it had uh, limited accuracy, so it was targeted against uh, broad area London. Uh, the V2 uh, uh, had a, a considerable psychological impact. Uh, there was no warning. Uh, significant explosions occurring uh, without warning. Unlike the, the buzz bomb. Yeah, the unlike the buzz bomb. And it did a certain amount of destruction. Uh, uh, I don't know how many were actually launched, but uh, a fairly large number. Uh, the uh, uh, effect on us as fighter pilots uh, was minimal. Uh, it was uh, 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 an awareness of a new weapon, uh, therefore potentially some shift in the balance of uh, strength. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, I never had any grave uh, doubts about what the outcome of the war would be. In other words, that we would win. It was more a matter of uh, what would be the cost and how long it would take than uh, who would ultimately win. But there too, if, uh, if the uh, V-2 had been uh, available operationally at a much earlier time, it could very well have uh, substantially affected the outcome of the war. Uh, another development uh, that was 
uh, becoming uh, apparent even to us fighter pilots was uh, radar. Uh, there was uh, what it today would be considered pretty limited capability, but I can remember uh, on uh, some of the missions that we were flying, especially later in the war, uh, hearing a, a, a buzzing sound in our radio. You'd hear a buzz that would rise and then fall uh, and cyclic. And uh, it was not known at the time, or at least not to me, but it was the low frequency radars of the Germans that were sweeping the uh, sky. Mm -hmm. And you'd hear the uh, buildup of radio energy in your causing interference in our VHF radios. Uh, so radar was appearing on the scene uh, for, uh, obviously, for tracking airplanes and therefore for uh, air defense and related purposes. Uh, air, uh, radar was also starting to be used by our bombers uh, in uh, limited ways to uh, uh, find uh, tar their targets uh, in bad weather. Uh, we had an experimental project that I remember uh, uh, was introduced to our airplanes, uh, which was a radar transponder that uh, one airplane in each squadron was was equipped mm. with, and its purpose was was as a transponder to respond to uh, to interrogation by U.S. radar to identify and fix position. Friend or foe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, Another uh, innovation which uh, appeared very, very late in the war, but on the U.S. side, was a proximity fuse. And in the course of uh, my flying over, over occupied Europe and Germany uh, for hundreds of hours, uh, I had uh, been exposed to uh, a large number of uh, anti-aircraft uh, shells uh, that the high, high altitude uh, shells of the Germans were their 88 millimeters. And <clears throat> they uh, would be a considerable, a large explosion and a big uh, puff of smoke plus a lot of shrapnel. And uh, quite a number of those uh, were close enough to uh, be heard and even felt and uh, do even limited damage to my airplane in the course of several missions. And of course, they were terribly destructive against the bomber formations that were flying in their uh, steady paths. Uh, if the proximity fuse had been developed uh, uh, by the Germans and introduced early, it would have been terribly destructive. It would have increased the accuracy of their hmm. anti-aircraft fire by a considerable degree. What exactly did the proximity fuse do, and how, how did it... The uh, early proximity fuses, which were perfected uh, by the U.S., were tiny little uh, uh, limited capability radars that were uh, uh, embedded in the uh, fuse section or the nose section of a, of a large shell, built obviously to withstand the uh, shocks and, uh, and uh, other effects of, uh, of, uh, of being fired from a gun barrel. Uh, it would emit, a, emit pulses of radio energy and uh, uh, detect the, uh, the return, which is how radar works, and uh, in effect uh, would uh, determine the, the point of closest approach and, and detonate the shell. Those, that was the way in which the earliest uh, proximity fuses worked. Uh, what about the, the Weary Willie program? I've, I've heard that phrase before. <laughs> Were you involved in that? Yes. Uh, Weary Willie was a, uh, a name given to uh, B-17 airplanes that had been converted to be uh, flown by remote control as drones. And uh, the term weary, weary willy came from the fact they took war-weary airplanes that had essentially been worn out in war. <laughs> 
and modified them to uh, become drones. And um, the, uh, the, the drone airplanes uh, were equipped with a radio receiver, uh, which was uh, receiving signals from uh, another airplane, which had the transmitter. And the signals were coupled into the uh, airplane's autopilot and control system in a way that it could uh, uh, handle the major maneuvers uh, required for, for a B-17. In other words, turns, mm -hmm. increase, decrease power, change altitude, hold altitude, things of that kind. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, airplane so equipped uh, could be loaded with uh, several thousand pounds of very high uh, uh, explosive. It was a material that I remember was called Torpex. It was a, high, a very high explosive. The airplanes, of course, then were equipped with fusing devices so that uh, impact or other uh, events would call, would trigger the explosive and you'd have a major explosion. Uh, my involvement with that program uh, really started with uh, being assigned as a uh, a flight director, and we were still flying P-38s, to escort uh, uh, one of these drones being flown or controlled by a B-17 radio control director on a mission uh, up to the uh, North Sea uh, uh, to a German submarine base on an island called Helgoland, which was up in, uh, I don't remember now whether it was in the Norwegian uh, sea, or it was somewhere north of Germany. Uh, it could have been even over in the, in the in the Bering Sea. I just don't remember the exact location. Uh, but it was one of the longest missions I ever flew. And uh, the mission was designed so that the uh, the B-17s, the drone and director, were flying uh, just off the uh, surface of the uh, North Sea at uh, a few tens of feet to avoid detection. Mm. And uh, we were assigned to fly uh, to protect them from uh, uh, interdiction or attack. And uh, so we were flying very low, and during much of the missions, uh, some of us on one side and some on the other, watching across and, and around. Uh, uh, but that, uh, that mission, uh, which I can remember so vividly, the uh, uh, director airplane was equipped, uh, its terminal guidance was a television set. Remember now, this is 1945. Mm. So there was a television transmitter and picture tube in the nose of the drone, uh, pointing, uh, taking a picture along its flight path. And with that picture was being received in the director in a little four-inch uh, square cathode ray tube uh, television receiver. And the uh, uh, radio control pilot in the director uh, flew that television image right into the uh, uh, doorways of that sub-pen uh, where it, that B-17 penetrated and created a, a lot of, uh, of destruction uh, in that submarine uh, a very installation. heavily defended area, I'm sure. Very heavily defended. Did you so, meet a lot of uh, opposition as the escorts? We didn't meet any aerial opposition. In other words, uh, we were prepared for uh, uh, fighters, uh, but none appeared. Uh, but the, uh, and the attack had been flown at low level all the way. And so it had a s significant element of surprise. And uh, even the... Uh, uh, the ground anti-aircraft defenses were caught by surprise, so the immediate reaction was quite limited. Of course, the mission was to get that drone in and cause mm -hmm. it to penetrate the, uh, uh, the submarine uh, uh, safe harbor and uh, then for the director and us to withdraw, which uh, we did. Um, so none of us received any damage in that particular mission. Now, there were there were a number of these uh, Weary Willy uh, missions flown. The one I just described was uh, one that I escorted. Uh, uh, 
I've never gone back and really uh, researched the details, but I believe they were, they, meaning the Army Air Corps, was converting also some B-24s for this purpose. And uh, 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 President uh, John Kennedy's older brother, uh, Joe Kennedy, was killed in one of these operations. Uh, his role was as a pilot to take off this explosive laden, laden drone, set it on course, turn the control over to a director, and then exit by parachute. Mm -hmm. That was the technique of the, uh, of the Weary Willie program. And uh, uh, something went wrong in the course of that, and the airplane exploded the drone, and uh, uh, Joseph Kennedy uh, Jr. was killed. Mm -hmm. So th the Army Air Corps was, uh, was moving up, if you will, rather rapidly and substantially uh, with these early guided missile uh, efforts and uh, using them, I think, quite effectively. They were used not only for uh, a mission like I described to attack a highly defended uh, submarine base, uh, but they were used uh, rather extensively to attack the launching ramps for the uh, V-1s. Uh, those uh, launching ramps uh, 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 that were built in places like Calais and along the coast of France and Belgium uh, were very highly defended. So it was a, a uh, well, a, almost a suicide mission sure. for a direct manned uh, airplane to attack. Well, the cumulative effects of these successes, such as the one you just described, uh, of course, uh, contributed to the winning of the war. Do you remember uh, hearing that the war had been won in Europe and uh, hostilities were to end? Uh, of course, <laughs> in May of 1945. Uh, the, uh, the fact that the war was uh, essentially over was becoming apparent as, as we got into, uh, into the spring of uh, 1945. The official a declaration of uh, of uh, surrender by the Germans uh, was in May of 1945. Uh, at that point, the uh, war in the Pacific and with Japan was uh, far from over. Uh, and the outcome uh, was, uh, in many ways, far from uns far from certain. So uh, many of the units uh, then in uh, Europe uh, were uh, placed under orders to prepare for uh, uh, movement and deployment to the Pacific Theater. Our, our fighter group was one of those. Uh, we were, uh, we set up a program of, uh, of largely ground instruction uh, to learn more of, of uh, the geography of the Pacific and the course of the war to then uh, and the order of battle. Your and, mm -hmm. So uh, we were, uh, we set up courses, in other words, with our intelligence officers largely being responsible for conducting the uh, courses. Um, so we were uh, 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 busily involved in, uh, in uh, uh, preparing to be moved to the Pacific Theater. Uh, our airplanes were slowly uh, being uh, ordered away from our base and up to a major depot base there in England that the Army Air Corps had at uh, Burtonwood, uh, where, where they were uh, being prepared uh, for transshipment uh, to uh, uh, the Pacific Theater. So from See, May, the war in Japan ended in August. Uh, we were preparing to move. Uh, uh, orders for our group's uh, deployment uh, never came through. And uh, I also very well remember uh, the date in August when it was announced that the Japanese had surrendered. By which time, of course, the uh, news and publicity of the uh, atomic bomb attacks uh, uh, had uh, had become available, and 
course, that was, uh, in many ways, the ultimate technological development in World War II, uh, the advent of, of nuclear weapons. Your role then changed with the, uh, the advent of the uh, uh, completion of the war in, uh, in the Pacific, and you stayed on in Europe for a time. Yes. Uh, 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 remember that I had a regular commission, which I had obtained, uh, as we discussed earlier. So in the, in the period uh, after the war in Europe ended in May of 45, on into the summer, uh, as I remember, there were two of us left in the group who had regular commissions. I was one, and uh, another officer, a major. Uh, I was by then a major also. Uh, named Bob Lacey had a regular commission. Uh, the rest of the group was made up of, uh, of reserve and, and uh, non-regular uh, uh, people. The, uh, uh, I remember, I don't remember exactly the month, it was perhaps June or July, when uh, we received uh, a communication uh, uh, announcing that uh, one officer, one regular officer with a regular commission from the 364th Fighter Group uh, could attend the, uh, the uh, uh, War College, as it was called in those days, the, the Army War College. And there were only two of us, Bob Lacey and I. And uh, so we set up a properly uh, supervised uh, competitive selection uh, in which we got in uh, one of the second floor rooms in our barracks and uh, had an uninterested party flip a coin out the window. <laughs> Having chosen in advance uh, who was head and who was tails, well, it turned out that Bob Lacey won the toss, so he got orders to the uh, War College. So I stayed behind and wound up uh, uh, then responsible for uh, some of the wind-down phase of, uh, of our group there in England. Uh, when uh, the war in Japan ended, uh, there was a tremendous rush to get the troops home. And uh, the uh, U.S. set up a major port operation at Le Havre in France, among others. And there were just thousands of uh, troops that were being flowing into uh, the Harve, and as fast as uh, the Army and the Navy could get transports in there to load them up and take them home, uh, they were doing it. It was a massive operation, almost unbelievable. But you were not in uh, France at the time. You... No, I was still in England, mm -hmm. but I was trying to set the environment where the mm -hmm. mood was mm -hmm. get the troops home, and tremendous port operations were set up, uh, and in the in that period, uh, the orders were that uh, any officers uh, in the Army Air Corps, at least in our uh, sphere, who um, had regular commissions uh, had to stay behind uh, the, the, and play a role in, in uh, winding down and supporting the activities to uh, get uh, uh, people and material uh, redeployed uh, home. So uh, uh, I received orders transferring me from uh, my fighter group in England to the theater headquarters at Frankfurt, uh, Germany. Uh, that theater headquarters had just been established. It was General Eisenhower's uh, headquarters, USFET, United States Forces European Theater. And the mission of that headquarters, of course, was to uh, organize for and to uh, uh, carry out the uh, duties of the Army of Occupation in Germany. And uh, there was a major uh, government section uh, headed under Eisenhower by General Clay, General Lucius Clay, who operated principally, uh, as I recall, out of Berlin, to handle the, uh, the intergovernment uh, activities. You know, remember the quadra the quadri quadripartite, quadripartite mm -hmm. 
agreements, French, British, Russian, and uh, American, uh, for segregating Germany, segregating Berlin. Uh, the uh, mission of uh, our part of the headquarters in Frankfurt under General Eisenhower was to uh, organize for and then to provide for the supervision of the, uh, all the army units uh, uh, for the occupation of all of Germany. The, <clears throat> uh, as I recall, we organized with 3rd Army and 7th Army. General Patton still had the 3rd Army and uh, uh, the 7th Army, I've kind of forgotten now mm -hmm. who, who the commander was. But uh, so that was a, a, a whole change of uh, environment for me to go from being a at the end of the war, I was a squadron commander in the fighter squadron in England to uh, G1 in the theater headquarters. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, officer who was General Eisenhower's G1 personnel was uh, a General Jim Bevins, who was a major general. He had come up through the 15th Air Force route through uh, Italy and the invasion of the, the war in Africa and Italy and up through the southern route and had wound up uh, on General Eisenhower's uh, staff in, in the uh, G1 position. Uh, so he was an Air Corps mm. officer and uh, there were two of us assigned uh, there to the theater headquarters in G1. Myself and another major who had come from a 9th Air Force B-38 unit. Uh, by then located on the continent. The two of us then as Air Corps majors were in G1. And, uh, in, you know, my, my technical education uh, notwithstanding, I was assigned uh, in personnel and uh, was given responsibility for a sphere of the activities having to do with troop morale, which turned out to be a very good experience, uh, having to pay attention to uh, uh, the lives and uh, welfare of uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, troops in a, uh, providing uh, occupation. Mm. In a How did fraternization play a role in that and the morale and the, uh, the mixing? Uh, the, the troops had an order not to fraternize that's, with That's true. Uh, fraternization was banned and there were penalties uh, and for good reason at that time. Uh, so uh, uh, it was, you know, of course, inevitable that there was interaction among uh, the uh, uh, occupation forces and the local populace. Uh, certainly, a lot of that interaction was required on the on the uh, government level, uh, the and even uh, commerce level in providing for. Uh, transportation and uh, food and shelter and all the other things. And also in that period there were just thousands, maybe even certainly tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of displaced persons that were uh, scattered around. Poles, Czechs, uh, people from uh, that had fled uh, some of the Eastern European countries in particular. So there were very large uh, DP camps they were called, displaced person camps that were set up to handle the uh, uh, return in general to their homelands of all these displaced people. So uh, 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 providing an environment in which uh, army troops who had just won a war could uh, live in a civilized fashion and provide for uh, supervision uh, in a proper way of an occupied country and a captivated uh, uh, populace uh, was was a, a substantial challenge mm -hmm. and uh, so we had we paid a lot of attention to setting up uh, an offering uh, education programs uh, classes opportunities for these young soldiers and to uh, uh, in effect, role in a, some education programs, 
Uh, we <clears throat> paid considerable attention to uh, supervising the operation of clubs for enlisted NCO officers. Uh, we tried to, to be creative in permitting uh, recreational activities, uh, one of which uh, I took a hand in helping to get started, which was amateur radio. Amateur radio had been banned worldwide during the war for obvious reasons. So we set up uh, a, uh, a scheme very early in, uh, in uh, well, it was late in 45, early in 46, permitting uh, U.S. forces to uh, uh, be licensed as radio amateurs. In other words, those who had been licensed at, at home and had a uh, proper amateur license could be licensed in uh, in the uh, structure that we established there in occupied Germany. 